following program was provided by an independent producer solely responsible for its content. The opinions expressed do not necessarily represent the views of this station, its staff, board of directors, or underwriters. Don't adjust your screen. There is nothing wrong. You are about to enter a world where the very concept of time is rendered obsolete by the sheer power of entertainment. You're about to enter the Bogus Hour. Hey, welcome to another exciting episode of The Bogus Hour. My guest for the entire show is a comedian, an author of two books, Stories I Tell and More Stories I Tell. He's an artist, a musician, he's been a lawyer, he's a heck of a storyteller. He is my guest, Paul D'Angelo. Things change. Look at this. How many years you drink out of a tap, it was fine. And now all of a sudden you get to drink out of the ball. I had a girlfriend, she would come over to my house and drink five of these things every time she came over. Always had a French name. Can I have a Soleil? Can I have an Evian? Can I have a Perrier? Can I have another Perrier? You just had one. I need another Perrier. I'm not cheap, but it adds up. <laughs> my friend said, Paul, go to a warehouse store. Go to Costco, BJ's, Sam's Club. I'm not doing my food shopping at Costco. They have good food at Costco. Yes, they do if you have a big family. You don't do your food shopping at Costco when you live alone like I do. I'm not willing to make a lifetime commitment to one type of salad dressing. <laughs> I like Thousand Island now. I don't know if I'm gonna like it in 10 or 15 years when the big vat I bought is half full and my friends are going, this is stale. No shit, it's been stale for nine years. Help me finish it. I saved a buck 50 in 1997. I'm a financial whiz. For a year, this girl drank so much of my Evian. For a year, she drank so much of my Perrier. I figured she became, what's that French word? A connoisseur of the bottled water, but she wasn't a connoisseur. Because the last six months, I was filling up the bottles from Le Fossat. <laughs> from the waters of the town Reservoir. <laughs> in fact, it's the same water we use to flush Lake Toilet. <laughs> so your taste is in your derriere. <laughs> so we just saw a little bit of stand-up from my guest, comedian, author, Paul D'Angelo. Hi, Greg. Pleasure to be here. Welcome to the Bogus Hour. Thanks for having me. Well, so let's start right from the nuts and bolts of uh, your comedy career. How did you decide to become a comedian? How did I decide? I have kind of a, an unusual path to uh, being a comedian. I was a, I was a prosecutor. I was an assistant district attorney in Essex County, Massachusetts. Um, no, had no intention of <laughs> being a comedian or anything like that. But I used to go, I, I started it when I was in the prosecutor's office. I used to go to see... Uh, the comedy shows, like at the Connect, the old Comedy Connection and stuff, and uh, I love Stephen Wright. I used to go see him, and um, never dreamed of doing it myself. But uh, I actually uh, kind of—I guess you would call it performed at a bachelor party at my that my best friend had. It was like like a roast, and yeah. I had writ I wrote like a 45-minute presentation. Everybody was waiting for me, and I was pretty drunk when I did it. But uh, I had so much fun, and everybody liked it so much that when I went back to the comedy shows, instead of being just a spectator, I went as a as a critic, and ah. I watch you guys and go, I think I could do this. I think I'd be better than this guy. So because I was a, a, a good lawyer, I, I couldn't do the obligatory um, uh, period where you suck as a comedian. <laughs> so I, I wrote for a year uh, before I got on stage. I, I had actually done like 100 jury trials or, or judge uh, bench trials. So I wasn't worried about the presentation. I, was, I, I wanted like 25 minutes of material before I did five minutes. So I only did about a dozen open mics, and I quit because my parents were on my back. What are you doing this for? You're an attorney. You're embarrassing us. <laughs> and uh, I quit. And just before I was ready to take a job with a law firm in Boston, I panicked. I called up uh, Barry Katz, who's now the producer of uh, Last Comic Standing, and yep. Mike Clark, Lenny Clark's brother. And I lied. I had a piece of paper with all these places in New York that I hadn't really played and told them to come and see me. And they came to see me, and I started headlining after like a dozen open mics uh, and uh, working three, four, five, six, seven nights a week and 
working at the DA's office at the same time. So you were you were moonlighting as a comic as you're working at the DA. Yeah, I, it was like having two, like pretty much full time jobs because uh, I was exhausted. I was going out to Worcester. I was going to. <laughs> Amherst, the Providence, Rhode Island, Manchester, New Hampshire, getting up the next day. A couple of those years, I was supervising the busiest jury session in Massachusetts. Wow. In, in um, Peabody, it had all the Lynn cases, it had a big volume. And uh, I was exhausted, but I, I was, it was fun. I, mean, I caught the tail end of that big comedy boom, boom yeah, and, uh, which allowed me to work all the time and develop. And I was really dedicated to, to uh, improving myself and writing more and getting better. So I worked hard at it. and. Uh, then I quit after after I had, I had been in DA's office 11 years. I had been doing like eight of those years. I've been doing comedy too. Quit to, to go to L.A. and I became a defense attorney by act. It's just a whole story. Where I I became a defense attorney. Somebody asked me to fill in one day. I said no. I'm moving to L.A. I got a deposit on the place and. I ended up in court the next morning with a hangover and a hundred cameras looking at me about some case that was supposed to be dismissed like the next day because my guy wasn't even there and right. a year and a half later I I would had a practice as a defense attorney and then I got wow. fed up I used to say I used to do good things for bad people so <laughs> I, uh, I got fed up and I moved out to LA and uh, been doing the comedy full-time ever since now do you think that your experience as, a, as an attorney as a lawyer in court actually gave you the confidence to get up in front of a, a comedy oh, yeah, crowd? absolutely well first of all when, you, when you've been yelled at by a judge in front of a jury or a crowded courtroom I mean how much can a heckler bother you? Right, really? you, know, right. you think about it. But, but I mean, just having that presence of getting up in in, in front of people, having like curveballs thrown at you, so you have to think on your feet. Um, I, you know, some some lawyers are very just rote. They 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 have no personality. They're monotone and everything. But I have this little theatrical. I'd get the gavel all the time. <laughs> this is not a comedy club. <laughs> so uh, you know, but. Uh, but uh, yeah, that was a great prep, and, and and it gives you it gives you discipline. Writing, well, I had to, I, I wrote two books. I used to I used to clerk for judges in the probate court in uh, Middlesex and that's County. A, just a ton, people don't realize that's a ton of writing. I mean, it's just well, and you have to you have to punctuate, and you have to have you have to be able to have right. good grammar and the no classic, English and crossing your T's yeah, and dotting your I's yeah. because you and if you make mistakes quotes and things and stuff like that. Yeah, so that that's that all of that was helpful. I mean. You, the lessons you learn in law school and and and, and, and as a lawyer, m more as a lawyer, um, yeah, you can apply to not only comedy, a lot of other jobs. Right. So we'll talk about your latest book first. I will ask you some questions about your first book, which is Stories I Tell. Sure. And so I've been reading this, and and first of well, all, let's talk about the first book first, and then we'll that because the second book's kind of a sequel, but there's no sequence. There so we you go. Can figure that one out. <laughs> yeah. So I'll ask you about how you became Paul D'Angelo. Oh, how I became, that name you mean? Yeah. Oh, well, my, my last name is really Murphy. But when I was in the DA's office, I didn't want them to know I was doing, con I didn't know if they'd allow this. I was kind of oh. like the Jackie Robinson of DA's who became <laughs> has there, Have you ever bumped into anybody else that has done that? Well, well, well yeah, you, 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 you're ahead of me okay. almost because, uh, well, the first night I went up to do comedy, my friends used to call me Angelo in, in college because everything about my life was Italian. I grew up with my Italian grandparents from Sicily, my right. uncle Vito, my mother, they all spoke Italian in the Ita Italian. I never saw an Irish relative my whole life. And I was mostly Italian. So when I went to college, we always had an excuse every month why we didn't meet women. And then the, the uh, excuse du jour was that I was, uh, I was, everything about me was Italian except for my last name, and that's why women thought I was a liar, which meant that my friends were liars, and that's why we weren't, you know, getting, getting lucky. So, Put it all on you. So <laughs> they used to call me Angelo. They're going to give you an Italian name, so, so you, you're more credible. So, right. so the first time I did the comedy, I said, well, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll be Angelo. But, in, but then if somebody called my name, I would, I, so I said I made that into a last name. I'm, by the way, I'm only going to do this once and get it out of my system, and, right. and, which is what my mother said the first night I did it. She goes, I'm glad you get that out of your system. And uh, <laughs> Little the first you know. night I went up on stage, there was a guy with my real name <clears throat> who was 400 pounds and waddled up <laughs> on stage, and he was terrible. He was horrible. <laughs> and his only laugh, he, he actually physically lifted up his, his stomach and said, how do you like my new belt buckle? Uh, my friends were peeing themselves. <laughs> they go, they're going to think this guy is you. He's horrible. <laughs> so um, I said, I better keep that name. And then when I started headlining, there were a couple instances where people came up to me and said, I just want to tell you that um, I heard the guy in the next table say, that looks like the guy who sent me to prison. <laughs> but that guy was Irish, and this guy's Italian, so it must be a different guy. So I better keep the two separate. So I went out to L.A. I tried to go back to my real name, and uh, they already knew my name. So 
So there, uh, it, there just, it, was. it just stuck. Uh, and there's another story about you getting uh, assaulted by a large woman on stage. Well, uh, I have a routine. <laughs> It's, 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 I'm John Madden, and I go to. It's 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 about a relationship. But my girlfriend does something like like every man has had an experience with a woman. Like this does not make sense at all. Right. And I don't know what happened. And John Madden comes in the door and explains. He goes to the chalkboard and explains what she did in right. like football terminology. And so like it's like a, you know, some of my bits are like three four minutes long, and uh, it's a big theatrical piece and stuff. And uh, I was closing out a show uh, with that bit. And I had to, I, I was looking at my watch because I had to do another show at the uh, at the Hilton at the airport, and I had to get out of there. So I, I was I was literally 30 seconds from the end of that bit, and I'm got the thing, and I'm John Madden, and this guy's going on and out, outside the tackle and everything. And all of a sudden, I so I thought some woman was approaching the stage, but she tackled. She must have played powder <laughs> puff or something because uh, it was like Lawrence Taylor. I mean, my feet left the ground. I was. I, <laughs> Uh, she literally legend she... has it that I yelled into the microphone, "What the?" <laughs> while I was in the air, and, and I mean, it was a perfect form tackle. Thank God it was the stage was only this oh, this man. high, and um, they they got her off of me, and they they <laughs> took her outside, and they don't know if they were she was drunk or crazy or a little of both, and um, and people I was. I was stunned, and I was fortunate I wasn't hurt. And people were yelling, "Is that part of the act?" I go, "Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm risking being a paraplegic to to uh, get a laugh." Oh, no, it no, wasn't part of the act. Yeah, broken ribs Somebody are part said, of my closure. Did you get her number? I go, I, I think it was 63. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, I got tackled in the middle of, and and they said, "Why did you do that?" She said, "I thought it would it fit with the routine." <laughs> oh man, yeah, people, uh, you you know that that it's always the. Loudest, most obnoxious oh, yeah, person yeah, who comes up show. after the show. Oh, your, wasn't oh, that great? Wasn't I great? Oh, you yeah, were the best. Help. I couldn't have done it without you. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Yeah, that's that story's in the book. The, yeah, the, the books. It should say that the books are just a a series of uh, of stories. Um, uh, I write a lot. You know, I I write, I, I write a lot of material. It keeps it fresh for me. I've ha I have three CDs that are fifty minutes long. Each one's totally different. Right. I have two DVDs. That have been released. Half of the DVDs are not on the CDs, so um, I and I had hundreds and hundreds of pages in my computer and uh, and things that I had written down were great stories. And I said, what a waste because these are all funny stories. But maybe sometimes they come across better on the page than the stage right. and things. So I just started compiling them and writing writing these stories into a book. And then um, I. Uh, I just let it alone. I just I get discouraged with the whole publishing process, and and I went out to L.A. and a, a comedian who I, I won't mention, who's a friend of mine, who's a nationally known comedian, gave me his book, and I couldn't wait to read it. I said oh, it's going to be great, and I started reading his book. I go, my book's a hundred times better than this. So I went back and I uh, uh, we got the book published, and uh, and um, it won a whole bunch of awards. The first one won a, a E Lit award, a gold medal, which is an international uh, 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 contest that. Uh, Rewards uh, excellency in in uh, digital publishing. It was a finalist in the International uh, Book <laughs> Awards, uh, honorable mention in New York Book Awards. It won the uh, best comedy book of 2016. Wow! Uh, the best of Los Angeles awards and stuff, and uh, it went really well. And I had more stories, and I I, I made an, and everybody so, say, hey, we want more. So from stories I, I tell to more stories. More stories I, I tell. Very clever. Names. Very yeah. good. Yeah. So I have uh, almost finished this. And I try not to oh, read the really very. Actually, you actually oh yeah, I try not to read the very yes, end because I don't want to give any spoilers. So, uh, and I'm looking it's, it's, it's forward to. It's not a mystery. It's not know, like a, I know. Not lead the butler did it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's not like that. But it. Uh, and I'm looking forward to reading that. And you said that's. I say it's a bathroom book. I did, people think I'm kidding. I said it's a short, funny stories. Everyone's right. funny. They're quick, in the style of my act. So it's bing, 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 fast, f fun read. And I said leave it in the bathroom. Right. Read it one story at a time. If you had a bad burrito, read. Three stories, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and that's what's great about having, you know, read, reading it in preparation for the show is that it's something that I can do can some work, it up and put read it, down it and, yeah, and then go through a couple yeah. of chapters, and they're, and they're just they're nice, quick, fun, yeah, bing, bing, punchy bing. stories, yeah. which is what your, your act is known for, good stories and a lot of, of punchlines. Yeah, you know, when people ask me what kind of comedian, you know, compare yourself to someone, which is a tough thing to do. And, right. But I, I never can really say because I, I don't know who's really my style but the m more people say only for lack of a better fit George Carlin right and uh, and I think I'm more of a storyteller than a, I'm not a 
set up punchline right. guy sitting at the microphone. Uh, you know, sure, sure. Kind of thing. I like I act things out. And yeah, you're very animated. You've voice, got a lot not of voices like impressions, but you know, I'll, I'll act out. I act out a lot of dialogue in my right. act. Yeah, yeah, in some way. Yeah, and like, I think these stories, a lot of these are dialogue. And I'll, I'll tell you, I, my brother's coaching minor league, uh, little league right now, and I said, keep feeding me with the stories because I'm writing. I'm doing a blog now and stuff, but my brother, every day, it's something else with these kids at the Little League. I said, <laughs> keep, keep them coming. Now, have you ever thought of writing a play? No, I never did. Because no. you're good with dialogue. And... A play? No, no. I've had, I've had, um, I've had, uh, I, I, I've, I've written, um, I did a, a, a sitcom pilot that was featured in the International, um, New York International Film Festival, um, and just my luck, um, I had like meetings in LA. I'd moved back and I had meetings in LA with some big production companies to maybe make it into a sitcom. And they were all psyched and stuff. I got there the month that reality TV hit. Oh. And they pushed it aside and said, if you got an idea for a reality show, we got this new thing, it doesn't cost us any money, it's great. And I go, well, sure. well how about this? We and don't stuff. have to and pay the I, real uh, talent. And I, I actually wrote a, I wrote, wrote a script called Murphy's Law, which was like kind of a cross between Bonnie Miller and and Night Court. And, oh, okay. And it was about, uh, like me, like a, a guy who was a, um, a, uh, a DA or a prosecutor who became a defense attorney and then came back to the same little court, and he knows all the people in the courthouse and the cops, and they're all into and I, I And so many of those stories were real stories from court, and I gave it to somebody at a big uh, agency in L.A., ICM. I said, whatever you do, don't give it to an 18-year-old intern that oh. doesn't get it, because this is like... This is an old school sitcom, like Bonnie Miller, you know, all in the family type thing. And he wrote the most scorching like review and he said, This oh. stuff is is this stuff nobody would ever believe this stuff. And I'm going, This is all true. These are true stories. Right, right. These really happened. So yeah, didn't go far. But uh, no, I never I never wrote a play though. Well, wow, that's my, my recommendation. Yeah? Yeah. yeah play. So uh, you also used to do a little uh, picking uh, uh, oh, as my a... well, you know what? That, that was an important thing because when I first started out, when I said I headlined like right away, I had a guitar part in my act at the, that I added um, when I, after I took that little hiatus. And um, I'd only do like the last 10 minutes of the show. But, I mean, it would enable me to, uh, to headline. I also to open up for all these. I opened up for like over 60 like musical acts like Huey Lewis and the News and uh, Ray Charles, Aretha Franklin, and uh, the Beach Boys, Chicago, and stuff like that. And I'd use right. the guitar. And... Um, it all started because I had a, a song uh, about pa parking my car in Fenio Hall or something like that. My friends used to ask me to sing it late at night, and I added the guitar in. And um, I, I basically, I got tired of carrying it, getting there early, setting it up. And right. I, that's how lazy I am. Right, you know, right, oh, right. I'll, oh, besides the 45-minute show, I actually have to get there <laughs> at the beginning and set it up and wait and break it down and carry it in there. Oh, my God, that's like a job. I'd need so, a roadie uh, for that. I, and I had too much to say at that point. Right. So I... I I took it out of my act after only a couple of years, and um, the funny thing is, a couple of people asked for it the last few years, and so once a year I did like a guitar show where I used that at the end oh, of the really? act. Oh, I was so nervous. I mean, I do show, like I said, I do shows, you know, for, for somebody, and there's 5,000 people there in the old days, because I didn't know any better, right. and that's what I did, and now... I'm a better guitar player, better singer than now. So there's 150 people in the whole go, Oh my God, I'm so nervous. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's funny how you go from one thing to another. And, yeah, it's, and, it's whatever you're used to, you know. But, right. but, but as soon as I recognized how bad I used to be, <laughs> yeah. nobody cared. It was fun. You know, <laughs> and you're new. Like and it was fun. Singing like instead of Rolling Stone, like a Flintstone. <laughs> how does it feel? <laughs> So guitar, uh, writing. You're also a, a good artist. I, I, you know, I'd, I'd seen. I can't remember who showed me the piece of your artwork sometime years ago. I'm like, wow, this guy is kind of a renaissance man. Yeah, although he's, I, didn't, I, didn't, I haven't done a lot with it. Um, I, you know, I went a long time without drawing and things. And my, my uncle had a house on the water in, uh, up in near Gloucester. And, uh, and he's old school depression, you know, so he had pictures on the walls. Like, you, you ever see the pictures in the front of a barber shop? They're all <laughs> faded because the, the sun got to me. All that's left is the blue. And right, right, right. And those pictures <laughs> held up with scotch tape inside the frame and Yellow everything. And I said, and... I want to buy you a, a nice seascape of gloss. Oh, no, I like those pictures. Those are my pictures. <laughs> I said, the only way I can replace them is to, I, I'll call my Drew it myself. 
So I drew a picture of Gloucester, and I hang up in Gloucester a lot, and of the old fishing boats and the things, and uh, he loved it. So I did a series of those, and I, I drew uh, actually the back of that, the first book, the self-portrait is me as the, me as the scarecrow. And that was supposed to be the cover, but I, was, I, I thought they might come after me. Oh, you know? right, right. Because I heard they still did. But, the, you know, because the movie hasn't made enough since 1939. <laughs> they haven't made their money back. And so they need to go after someone like me, Mickey Mouse. Yeah. That's, uh, and you actually used to, you did cartooning for a long time, right? You, uh, I know of uh, Aunt Ajax Bim. Who told you about that? Uh, a family, uh, oh family friend is, is yeah, when uh, I was actually a went to kid, school yeah, with you. That was my that was my only theatrical ex theatrical <laughs> experience. So when I was a kid, I used to just have this imagination because I was the, the oldest kid, so I had to amuse myself whether it was making models or drawing or, or, or stuff. And I used to I used to get up in front of like fourth, third, fourth grade classes and just make up stories off the top of my head about some fictitious character. <laughs> and I don't know where Ajax Bim came. Bim was some little kid called the milk that I don't know where it came and I saw a thing of Ajax on oh, that's funny. And I just made up these things and I used to get up and and I went between fourth grade and um, 30 years old when I got on stage wow <laughs> yeah that's it because uh, usually there's there's a there's, yeah, a there's something like you know theater in your background right. or public speaking right. oh I didn't mind public speaking and but you know everyone's always oh, funny with your friends a lot of people right. say that and they can't translate it to the stage but I uh, but I I was funny with my friends. Yeah. Nice. And, uh, well, you mentioned George Carlin. George Carlin actually has his ashes in uh, New Hampshire really? at Spofford Lake because when he was a kid, he went to summer camp at Spofford Lake. I didn't know that. And he first went on stage at really? summer camp in Spofford Lake. So no that kidding. was essentially where his wow. comedy, his, his entertainment or performing career began in New Hampshire. As a, wow. So yeah, I learned something. Ah, how about See, that? I come huh? here, I learned. <laughs> Is there anything that you're working on? Any, any? Uh, you you, you, uh, you said... know what? I'm, I'm really uh, putting a big push. I got this woman. I, I, I got a publicist out in L.A. to try to get. I said, you know, the books are, are very popular around here. How do I get them sold in Cleveland or Atlanta or San Francisco or whatever? How do I right. hit the rest of the country? So I got a publicist out in L.A. Mm. Um, he did a, a, a okay job, but I got this woman doing my social media that's helping me now. She's an animal. I got to hold her back once in a while. Right. Whoa, whoa. Because you, you're here. from the generation of the social media is kind of this well, also thought thing well, you know as far as selling yourself as a comedian. The, the way I was brought up, my father was, had tryouts with professional football. He was a Golden Gloves boxer. He was a Marine. He was like the, my hero, you know. Right. And he used to, if I spiked the football when I was a little kid, he'd say, don't show off. Right. Be humble, keep your mouth shut. And I'm in a business where sometimes the people with the biggest mouths get the most sure, attention. Sure, sure. So when I would start to put these things on social media, I'd go, oh, I feel like such a whore. I'm a media whore. Yeah. You know, I'm putting these things, bothering people and stuff. And she's now she got me thinking the other way. No, put them out there. Get them out. Get all this right. stuff. Because I, I have so much material. I have uh, I have video clips. I have memes that with little short little jokes that I'm, I put up there. Uh, I got this uh, feature with the books called Who's Reading My Book? Which I get celebrities, national and local celebrities reading my book. I put a little bio of them with the book and the one and, and with that, Tom Cotter is hysterical. Oh yeah. <laughs> and now now I've got this now I've got this like collection of ones. I don't even know I don't know if I'm supposed to do it or not. I got I, I got Elvis reading the book. I got the Pope. I got I got Obama's got the book, it's upside down. I got all these things that we put we put out once in a while and it's all nice. these celebrities. Oh, how'd you get Trump with your book? Go, Trump with my book? I mean, how'd I get Herman Munster with my book? I mean, it's, it's not, uh, you're not getting this. Oh, uh, that's yeah. funny. So that's cool. So yeah, I've actually seen some of you have been posting some short clips of your of your stand up. Yeah, yeah. And you know what? Because everybody who buys my book, almost not, not exclusive, but they're the fans of my stand up, and they and they they want more, so they they want to read the book. Because there's really not too many of my my routines. There's the stuff that I do on stage is in the book. There might be a couple here or there, or stuff that ended up being on stage right. after they were in the book, but um. But so I said, you know what? Let's market it like let's get my stand up out there to more people because that's what I do best. And then if they like the stand up, maybe they'll get interest in the book. So that's why I've been putting all that stuff out there. And when you do a show, do you sell your books at your show? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And it's funny, like some, some sh shows will sell a ton of them. And then sometimes, you know, people walk, oh, and they don't want to look at me. Shows in oh, Alabama, oh, I don't you know, want to sell 10 them. more bucks. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Alabama. No. <laughs> oh, it's got pictures for people from Alabama. <laughs> 
Well, uh, it's a pleasure having you on the show. Is Paul it over already? Oh, my God. Yeah, it's having that's, so much that's, fun. It's, uh, it's the bogus hour. Having fun, they say. Yeah, it absolutely goes like that. Yeah. Um, so I'd hope to have you on again sometime. Next time you're working that's on great. a project, new book. New uh, new album, please come and see me. Well, you're a good friend. I don't get to see yeah. you enough. We don't get to work together. Enough. Absolutely. So please uh, uh, go see Paul uh, when he's when he's performing. He performs all over. PDAngelo.com. PDAngelo.com. Or on Facebook, you find me. You find these videos. You like them. Buy his books. More. Yeah. Yeah, they're good books. Thanks, Greg. Well, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you, my friend. Great to see you. Great to see you. Cheers. Thanks. If you or someone you know would like to be a guest on The Bogus Hour, email us here at thebogushour at gmail.com. The preceding program was provided by an independent producer solely responsible for its content. The opinions expressed do not necessarily represent the views of this station, its staff, board of directors, or underwriters.